Hello guys, I'm uh, Benny Alevi. I'm going to present to you a master's benchmark that we did here in Scylla, demonstrating how workloads accessing petabytes of uh, information work on Scylla. So let's start with introducing myself. I'm uh, the director of software engineering here in ScyllaDB, and I lead specifically the uh, storage software development team here in Israel. I've been working on operating systems, storage and file systems throughout my career. Uh, in particular, I was working on uh, distributed file systems and um, NFS, if you're interested. Let me give you some uh, background about the motivation for doing this uh, benchmark. In the last year, we've, we are seeing more and more applications that are moved to the pub public and private clouds, and they access increasingly larger data sets that are collected and analyzed. And there is an increasing need to support these petabyte scale applications. These applications serve billions of uh, users. And uh, when you multiply these, the, the, the total number of users in the uh, size of the entities that they represent, you get petabytes of data that you need to store and uh, analyze. Data collection itself is, is rapid. You have uh, hundreds of uh, uh, users at a time per day uh, that generate events that need uh, to be collected rapidly. And this data also needs to be accessed by multiple applications, many times at the same time, that combine both online transaction processing and analytics applications. For the benchmark, we, want to, we wanted to model these applications. Um, so we chose to run two concurrent workloads at the same time. The first workload is a large user data set that contains uh, per user data. Uh, the data set itself is uh, read mostly, and it's updated regularly. Typically, this data set is used by analytics applications. And at the, at the same time, we wanted to run also a smaller but real-time oriented application data set, representing, for example, online bidding data for advertisement placement uh, that is accessed in online transaction uh, processing manner. Uh, this workload requires low latency to meet real-time deadlines and to maximize the algorithm's efficiency. So, for example, for EdTech, uh, the algorithms uh, calculate heuristics at a given time. They only have a few milliseconds to calculate these heuristics. Um, so the responsiveness of, of the database is critical um, to the application efficiency. So let's do a back of the envelope sizing of uh, the dataset. Say we have 1 billion users, and for each user we keep about 10,000 records, and each record could, could be like a URL that represents a click of this user. Uh, that takes about 100 bytes to, to store. This leads us to one petabyte of storage. And for the application, say we are accessing 10 million auctions at any given point in time. Uh, we keep a thousand records per auction and for each record is about 1000 bytes. We easily get to several terabytes of uh, storage that, need, that we need to access. So let's drill in and look at uh, the petabyte scale benchmark that we ran here in Scylla. First, Let's reiterate about the goals we had in mind when running the benchmark. So we first wanted to construct a petabyte, a petabyte scale Scylla cluster. Uh, it turns out that it's fairly easy, but not trivial. Uh, we wanted to load the database with data, and while doing that, measure the throughput of loading and the latency we get. Um, and that consists in order of one petabyte of user data and an order of one terabyte of application data. And then after loading the database, we wanted to run concurrent workloads over the user and application data sets. And for them, we measure the throughput and latency. Grossly speaking, the user workload 
was around 5 million transactions per second. And we uh, uh, measured two variants of it. One is uh, read-only, and the other is 80% uh, reads and 20% writes. And this represented a high throughput workload um, simulating online uh, analytics. At the same time, we ran a smaller 200K uh, transaction per second uh, application workload that was 50% uh, reads, 50% writes. And we cared about load latency for this workload that represented online transaction processing. On top of that, we wanted to demonstrate the use of workload periodization to balance these two workloads. All right, so let's uh, get down to it. What was the bill of materials? How did we build this uh, cluster? Um, we provisioned uh, 20 uh, virtual machines on AWS. The instance type was uh, i3en.metal. Each instance is pretty big. It has uh, 96 virtual CPUs. It has 768 gigabytes of memory, 60 terabytes of fast NVMe storage, and 100 gigabits per second uh, network interface. To be able to operate such a large cluster, we needed uh, 50 load generators. Each is uh, of type uh, C5n.9xlarge, uh, having 36 vCPUs, 96 gigabytes of uh, memory, and 50, 50 gig uh, network interface. The software we used uh, to operate the cluster was first um, Scylla Enterprise running on the uh, cluster nodes, version 2021.1.6. And uh, to generate the load, we used the industry standard Cassandra stress tool that was used over the Scylla shard aware Java driver, which is essential to get uh, the best performance uh, from the Scylla cluster. We also used a, the Scylla monitoring stack on the side for gathering the metrics uh, from the Scylla cluster and for presenting them. The Scylla monitoring stack uh, uses uh, Prometheus and Grafana. Let's describe uh, uh, the workloads that we uh, generated. Uh, first, the user key space was constructed as a key value dataset, having 500 billion keys, while their uh, value size was, uh, had a mean size of 600 bytes. Those represent uh, uh, one petabyte of uh, uncompressed uh, text data with a uh, three and a third compression ratio, meaning we compressed about 2,000 bytes per record uh, down to 600 bytes. We used uh, the LZ4 compression algorithm and we replicated the data twice in the cluster. Each key was uh, replicated to two nodes. Uh, for accessing the data from the user workload, we used a consistency level of uh, one. The keys themselves were randomly selected in a uniform distribution. Um, for the 8020 read write query workload, uh, we also used uh, Cassandra Stress. Um, while each of the 50 load generators used a normal distribution to draw random keys out of its assigned 150th range of the keys. And each load generator used 1,000 threads in a fixed uh, uh, transaction rate of 100,000 transactions per second. So this totaled uh, uh, 4 million read transactions per second plus 1 million write transactions per second. The workload itself ran for three hours and we set it up with five minutes uh, warm up time. To generate the application workload, we, use, uh, we used Cassandra Stress as well. Each of the 50 load generators used a normal distribution to draw its uh, random keys out of its assigned 150th range of the whole key space. We also used uh, 1,000 threads per load generator and a fixed uh, transaction rate, rate of 4,000 transactions per second. So this totaled of uh, 100k uh, um, read transactions per second 
and the same uh, amount of writes per second. The workload ran two for three hours with a five minutes warm up time. Okay, so we're ready to uh, show the results. First, let's talk about the data ingestion. Um, we demonstrated that we can insert the data at a rate of seven and a half million inserts per second using those 50 concurrent load generators. Uh, and with this uh, high throughput, we saw um, a 4 millisecond, 99% uh, write latency. Uh, that meant that we, we could load the one petabyte uh, cluster in roughly 20 hours. I find it quite impressive. What was the uh, CPU load during ingestion? So we measured around 90% CPU utilization on average. It was interesting to see, if you can look here at the um, HTOP uh, output, if you look at the top, you see four cores uh, that have, are loaded at 90%, um, but they all do kernel work. These cores uh, were serving uh, interrupts from the network. Um, and um, in these uh, large clusters, we um, assign these four cores statically to serve interrupts, while the other cores serve uh, um, the Scylla software. What were the storage demands during data ingestion? Um, so, it turns out that today's disks are able to handle multi-gigabyte workloads. And if you focus here on the uh, IOQ uh, throughput for commit log versus compaction, we see that uh, uh, the instances each used about 900 megabytes per second for commit log writes. Um, and interesting to see that if you sum it up, um, about 3,000 uh, uh, bytes per record times replication factor of 2, and you multiply it by uh, um, 50 nodes, you see that uh, uh, we get uh, to 7.5 million inserts per second, like we set up uh, Cassandra Stress. Now, this around 1 gigabyte per second uh, commit log traffic generated about 6 gigabytes per second per instance of compaction I.O. shown at the bottom. Overall, 20 cluster nodes times uh, 6 gigabytes per second gave us a total throughput of 120 gigabytes per second. It was also interesting to see the behavior of compaction when loading the disks. Um, Scylla introduced a few years ago a compaction algorithm called incremental compaction, and uh, in short, ICS, uh, which creates and deletes equal sized SS tables in contrast to the legacy uh, size tiered compaction strategy that creates increasingly larger SS tables. Now, when working with these equal sized SS tables, we can see that um, we can dramatically reduce the requirement for, for temporary space using compaction. And if you look at the graph, you can see the small increments um, where uh, the disk usage uh, is reduced in small increments whenever compaction is able to uh, um, delete temporary SS tables. And that's a complete contrast to size tier compaction strategy with which you can see huge fluctuations in disk usage. Okay, so let's get uh, to the meat of the benchmark. Uh, let's talk about throughput. Um, first thing we wanted to see how much we can load um, the uh, Scylla petabyte cluster and still provide single digit uh, millisecond latency for the 99 percentile. So at the graph, uh, uh, the bottom two lines in the blue and red 
um, show the, uh, the, the P, P50 read and write latency, respectively, uh, which is uh, well over one millisecond. Uh, while we loaded uh, the cluster with um, four million transactions per second on the left side, up to seven million transactions per second on the right side. And if you look at the uh, P99 latencies, again, uh, uh, the read P99 latencies in blue and the write P99 latencies in, in uh, red, we can see that as we increase um, the uh, uh, throughput inflicted on the cluster, uh, P99 latency uh, goes high. And if, we can if we continue to increase the uh, throughput, it would go sky high and become uh, unusable. But still, we demonstrated that we can get, uh, with uh, 7 million transactions per second, uh, we can get pretty decent uh, both mean and P99 uh, latencies out of the cluster. Uh, the numbers themselves are uh, presented here, uh, where we summed uh, uh, the application workload, uh, presenting uh, about 300k uh, read-write operations uh, on the cluster, while the user workload was uh, 7 million read-only operations per second. And uh, just to brag about it, P99 of the write latency for the application was a little over two milliseconds, while the read latency was a bit higher, uh, 6.8 milliseconds, uh, while the uh, user workload had a quite similar P99 uh, latency of uh, 6.4 milliseconds. Uh, for the rest of the benchmark, uh, we used uh, a slightly lower throughput, and we'll get to it later. Um, so let's drill in a, a little bit about uh, the system internals um, and look at the cache efficiency. Um, on the top graph, we can see uh, partition hits uh, around between six to eight, uh, 10,000 reads per second versus the partition misses on the bottom that are close to 400,000 reads per second. Uh, meaning that the hit rate uh, was only a little over uh, 1%, and this happened due to the randomness of the uh, key value reads uh, that didn't utilize the cache almost at all. Uh, so this shows us there is potential for using a uh, SIL extension to the CQL query language uh, called bypass cache that asks the server to just disregard the cache and uh, and uh, execute the query directly from, from disk. Uh, and by this, we save the overhead of uh, updating the cache. Uh, we kept that as a uh, future work item and we will get back to it uh, later on. Uh, just to note that the previous test that uh, we run showed that bypass cache can improve performance by up to 70%. And on the other side, of the spectrum, if uh, the whole data set fits in a cache, we can see improvements of up to a factor of four. So this is also an interesting uh, uh, case to be tested. All right, so get back uh, uh, to the workload. Uh, these are the uh, results for the um, five million read-only uh, user transactions per second, and 200,000 application uh, transactions per second that were distributed uh, evenly between 50% read and 50% write. Uh, in this case, um, uh, we can see that the um, um, application uh, latency in this case uh, was about between uh, 1.4 to 2.3 milliseconds for uh, write and read respectively. Next thing we wanted to compare this read-only dominated uh, workload, uh, maybe with a more realistic of 80-20 um, workload for the uh, user dataset. In this case, uh, the five million transaction 
per second were divided uh, using 4 million transactions per second for read and 1 million transactions per second for write. In this case, the interesting thing is that we, we saw a, a, a significant increase in P99 latency, both for the application writes and for the application reads. Um, that might breach the contract for the application that requires um, uh, latencies of, say, up to two or three milliseconds. Um, so in order to balance that, we deployed a mechanism uh, we call workload prioritization. And uh, with it, we kept uh, the number of shares granted for the application at 1,000 shares. Uh, while we reduced the number of shares granted to the, to the user workload from 1,000 to 500 shares. And uh, this uh, uh, table really nicely shows that um, we were able to reduce the application uh, P19 latencies significantly. So the write latency went down for, from around 2.5 milliseconds down to 1.2 milliseconds. And read latency went down from 4.5 milliseconds down to 3.7 milliseconds on the expense, of course, of the user workload that showed increased latency. The bottom line here is uh, using workload prioritization, we can dynamically um, balance and equalize the system resources and divide them between uh, uh, different workloads that share the same um, hardware infrastructure. And I'd also like to show some graphs uh, that uh, demonstrate how these service levels uh, uh, look in action. Um, so it's important to note that each service level has its own queues per shard uh, for consuming uh, CPU and also for consuming I.O. Um, so the top chart shows the um, application workload IOQ um, and the distribution of uh, the bandwidth per shard for this uh, type of queue. Um, and at the bottom, we see 20 times higher bandwidth consumption uh, for the user workload queues. And um, it's really important to show the separation of resources because these two workloads are significantly different and managing each of them uh, using different queues allows us to balance the priorities and serve uh, each workload according to the number of shares that are granted to it. As I mentioned before, uh, running this benchmark uh, wasn't a walk in the park. Um, so, as expected, uh, setting up and testing the uh, petabyte scale database wasn't trivial. Uh, but that said, it didn't take any unreasonable effort. Uh, personally, I was assigned uh, to run this task uh, just two or three weeks ago. And uh, I had to go over a few hurdles uh, to get it done. Um, so, first hurdle was uh, merely provisioning. So it took some time to find uh, an availability zone on AWS that had enough of um, uh, the instance types that we needed uh, uh, for the benchmark. Uh, so take a note of that and uh, if you plan to uh, uh, deploy such, such a large cluster, make sure to provision your resources uh, well ahead. Um, second hurdle was uh, tuning the hardware for such uh, uh, high workloads. Um, so if you, if you remember the uh, um, chart showing the uh, CPU utilization and the four IRQ handling uh, CPUs at the top, 
Uh, it turned out that, that, our, that our default assignment of uh, cores to uh, IRQ handling uh, wasn't optimized. And uh, we were able to um, overwhelm uh, just uh, two of the cores with uh, interrupts and we couldn't get to the level of throughput that we wanted to demonstrate. Uh, so to get that, I had to manually assign these uh, CPUs for IRQ handling. Um, and uh, we took a note of that and the fix for this problem will be merged uh, for our out-of-the-box uh, machine images uh, in the coming future. Um, another nitpick was uh, setting the um, uh, CPU power governor on each node to uh, performance uh, in order to maximize uh, the performance of the system. Um, as for the benchmark benchmarking uh, framework itself, um, it turned out that Cassandra Stress uh, wasn't really built and designed to work at uh, this uh, scale. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, just anecdotally, um, to create um, 500 billion keys, um, <laughs> we had to use a non-default uh, setting, uh, since the uh, default distribution for keys draws keys only uh, uh, from a space of uh, 100 billion keys. Uh, so when realizing that we just couldn't create uh, one petabyte of data, it turned out that problem was uh, uh, this uh, default distribution on Cassandra stress. Um, but this was uh, easily overcome by uh, uh, changing this uh, setting. Um, we also ran into some issues with the data collection library um, that needed to be uh, fixed to support such large uh, number of uh, uh, parallel uh, load generators. Um, as for the way we configured uh, the SILA nodes uh, for the record, uh, we've used the these uh, following non-default uh, configuration. So at the node level, as I mentioned, we used uh, four IRQ serving uh, CPUs rather than the two that are uh, set up by default. Um, we also used a, a, a mount option that's not default in the uh, version of Scylla that we tested uh, called the, uh, the discard option. Um, and if you're interested, uh, you can read more about it. Um, it's about uh, letting the NVMe drives uh, know when blocks on the disk are discarded and are no longer used. Um, so setting up uh, this option allows the file system to continually update uh, the, uh, the block layer uh, of discarded blocks. And this allowed uh, 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 much more stable um, uh, compaction performance. Um, and it's worth mentioning that this is now the default in our uh, open source uh, releases. Um, as for the Scylla configuration, we used a, uh, uh, a compaction static shares configuration of uh, 100 shares. Uh, we also uh, configured the compaction uh, uh, enforced mean threshold to true. The scheme itself used the incremental compaction strategy with a uh, 10 gigabyte uh, SS table size and the space amplification goal of uh, 1.25. As I mentioned before, we used uh, the LZ4 compressor uh, for compressing the data. To summarize, I would like to mention some uh, future work we have in uh, front of us. So first is a uh, white paper that's coming up uh, based on this benchmark and expanding on it. In addition, we plan to, um, to test uh, two more uh, workloads. Uh, the first is a uh, random read workload using uh, the bypass cache option that was uh, previously mentioned um, in order to optimize uh, the cache utilization during random reads. In addition to that, we are going to also test uh, a data set that fits entirely in the node's cache and demonstrate the maximum performance uh, you can get out of the, the cluster um, in a smaller 
using smaller data sets. Uh, just bear in mind that each instance uh, in this example, the i3 and metal, has 768 gigabytes of memory. So these smallish data sets are not so small. Thank you very much. Stay in touch. You can contact me in the uh, email address uh, below.